we'll make a start. Good afternoon. Hi. 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 Praise the Lord. Good to see you all. We praise God for your lives. Just wanted to start off with a passage in Colossians. Colossians, the first chapter. From verse 9, I'm going to read through to verse 13. It says, For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I'll read that first verse again, that verse 9. We pray for this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And that is our prayer today. Amen. Amen. That we may be filled with the knowledge of His will. Not our own will, not the will of anybody else, but the knowledge of God's will. Amen. Amen. We may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Our prayer today is that Lord, give us wisdom. Amen. Amen. Lord, give us wisdom, but also give us spiritual understanding. Amen. Amen. And then verse 10 says, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. Yeah. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Somebody shout amen to that. Amen. That we may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, not ourselves, not anybody else, amen? amen. But fully pleasing who? God. Fully pleasing God, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of our God. Verse 11 says, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. May the Lord release joy to us. Amen. Amen. May the Lord release joy to us. Amen. Amen. Yeah, this kind of joy is not, uh, is not happiness. It's far deeper than happiness. Amen. Amen. This is a joy that's a spiritual position. Understanding that it doesn't matter what comes my way. It doesn't matter what is said. It doesn't matter what is done. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of knowing Christ. The joy of being His son or His daughter. Amen. It is my strength. Amen. And then verse 12 says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the light. We need to give thanks to the Father because He's qualified us. Amen. The qualification of God is not the same as the qualification of man. Amen. Amen. The qualification of God is far supreme. Amen. When man disqualifies, God is able to qualify. Amen. When man qualifies, God is able to disqualify. Amen. The Bible says that we need to give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light, to be partakers of the, of the inheritance of His kingdom. Amen. Amen. That's why we've got this wonderful, wonderful series that we're in right now. It's called The Kingdom of Heaven is Light. And the first installment was The Kingdom of Heaven is Light and Mustard Seed. And then the second one, The Kingdom of Heaven is Light, a treasure, man who found a treasure. And today we're going to go into the third one. I won't tell you what it is, but we're just exploring the kingdom of heaven, which is the kingdom of light. Amen. Verse 13, the, the, last, the last piece I wanted to read. It says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Somebody shout an amen to that one. That is powerful. He has delivered us from the power of darkness through the sacrifice of His Son Jesus. We have been conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Jesus Christ is the Son of His love. Amen. So it is right that we give God thanks and praise. Amen. 
with exceeding great joy because we know the good news. Amen. We have heard the good news and we are ready to receive more of the good news. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. Praise be unto the Lord. Let us pray together and say, Father, we just want to thank you for, for today. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for what you have in store for us, God, to, to, to nourish us and, and to strengthen us, God, and, and to heal what is broken, what is wounded in us, God, through the entrance of your word. Father, we delight in your word, we delight in your truth, and we pray, Lord, that your truth be revealed. Give us wisdom and spiritual understanding, Father, to come face to face with your truth today and your name be glorified and magnified in my life and in the life of my brothers and sisters around me in this church and beyond. In the mighty name of Jesus and the people of God, they shouted and said, Amen. Come on, they shouted more emphatically and said, Amen. 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 It's time for us to worship the Lord. Are you ready to worship? Yes, yes. we are. God bless you. Hallelujah. 
blessed in his name. Psalm 103 says this, bless the Lord, all oh my soul, and all oh, that is within me, bless his holy name, bless the Lord, all oh my soul, and forget not his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with love and kindness and tender mercy.
to, to, to Hosea. Hence why I have in my Bible today, my little mark, as you can see them here, just to make sure I get to the sword quite quickly. So if you don't mind, just pick up your sword for me very quickly. Pick up your sword for me. And touch your neighbor and say, I've got my sword ready. I have my sword ready. Amen. I see some digital swords, I see some big swords. But I see swords nonetheless. Amen. We're going to pick the east. Amen. So, with that being said, even though it is my privilege and my honor to be continue to pick the part for us today, if it was a quiet disadvantage to have to go up the taps and career after the show in the last two weeks. If it was quite unfair to have to preach after they literally preached some of the best sermons I've heard them preach, literally ever, and I have to go lost. But if you really are with how athletics work and our relays work, essentially what they normally do is like they place the fastest run at the very end in order to bring the race harder. And I hope that will be the case here as well, but as we're preaching, I'm going to need you to pray with and for me. Amen? Amen. So the next time that tap ask is, oh, what dates are you available? Where can you preach? I'm putting my foot down. And I'm going first. I'm going to go last again. Because this thought is quite unfair. But with that being said, nonetheless, anyway, I trust that you're going to join with me. Amen? Amen. I trust that you're going to support me, to walk with me, and study with me, because really, what we're able to do today actually taps prayed very, very accurately what the purpose and the hope for my message is. I want us to dig really deep into the foundations of the kingdom in order to truly appreciate the revelation that we're receiving from this series. Amen? I want us to be a people with that and have experience that are willing to exegete, to stretch and really extract the gems that can be found from the scriptures. Amen? Because you see, in the course of the week, um, I just got the taps on Tuesday. I was meditating from what? Sunday, then Monday. I was meditating people. So I'm preaching next week, Sunday. What am I going to preach on? But in Matthew 13, mostly, or dancing around a few scriptures here and then. But we're preaching from the parables. What am I going to preach on? And I came across a parable in Matthew 13 as well, the parable of leaven. And I had my eyes set on it. There were a few things I was extracting from there about what leaven could represent and how I could, you know, kind of use it contextually for us as believers today. But as I was meditating and studying and listening back to the sermons um, from Taps and from Corinth um, in the weeks past, I just felt compelled to, to take my, my study and my focus elsewhere a little bit. I felt compelled that, you see, this, this I felt compelled to take my study in a different direction because the kingdom that we have now received, one thing I assessed as I was studying was that this is a kingdom that was also once missed. You see, we have received the kingdom, but that kingdom also was missed by the audience that was first preached to. And I wanted to make sure that we could go into the depths of what happened for them to miss this kingdom, so that throughout the course of this series, we don't make the same mistakes ourselves, amen? Mm -hmm. That we don't replicate these same kind of, you know, errors that, that were made by the initial audience that would preach the kingdom of God. And this will make sense in a moment as we journey along. So, what the aim of my message today, as Taps prayed from Colossians chapter 1, I'll read it one more time. It says, For this reason we also, since for the day I've heard it, do not cease to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I'm praying that this sermon today will lead us into a place of wisdom and spiritual understanding pertaining the mechanics of the kingdom of God. Mm. Amen? I'm praying, as it says in verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I'm praying that we will become fruitful kingdom citizens. Amen? That we will become fruitful kingdom citizens in our thinking, in our, in our behavior, in our application, in our relationships, in our families, in every avenue that we find ourselves in, that we will become a fruitful people. Amen? That will be strengthened with all might and according to his glorious power of all patience and long suffering. Giving thanks to the Father who is who? The an actor of the kingdom. Giving thanks to the Father who is the sovereign over the kingdom. Giving thanks to the Father who is the Lord over the kingdom. I'm praying that we will be filled today with spiritual wisdom and understanding. So if you're taking notes today, church, the title of my message is The Kingdom of Heaven is at Hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
This matter of the kingdom, as Taps preached two weeks ago, was the main focal point of Jesus' earthly ministry. Of the five top things, there were more of course, but the five main things that Jesus preached on, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven used interchangeably throughout the Gospels, came in unanimously undisputed champion at number one. And then following from the kingdom of God was the actor, the, the, the sovereign, the Lord, the God, the king of the kingdom was the topic of God the Father. So these two came very close to each other, showing us just into what's an interplanetary relationship between the two together being established. We have the kingdom of God, and then we have second, God the Father. Amen? Yes. And then the third topic that came in in Jesus' top five topics of, that he preached was the currency of the kingdom. So this topic here has to do with us, who I would say are the recipients of the kingdom, the audience of the kingdom. And the third topic was the substance required to enter and to participate within the kingdom. And this one, I'll give you a clue so you can work with me. We walk not by sight, but by faith. Faith came in third as the currency of the kingdom. And then following from the third, we have the fourth, which was the topic of money. The topic of money. And then the fifth, but well, money also being what Corinth taught us, unfortunately, can be a hindrance to entering the kingdom of God. Money, of course, can be of necessity in order of practically advancing the kingdom of God and being able to establish a few practical things necessary, but it can also be something that causes us to misplace our treasure. It can also be something that causes us to misplace our focus. It can also be something that causes us to misplace our hunger and our thirst. It's current evidence with the parable of the rich young ruler. And then last and certainly least, what came in his top five of topics preached was the enemy of the kingdom himself, Satan. The enemy of the pulse and throat of the kingdom came in at the bottom of the barrel, suggesting to us where we should place it. Amen. On our feet. Amen. Amen. So last and certainly least was Satan. So these were the five main things that Jesus preached on. In fact, when we look at the synoptic gospels, that being Luke, Mark and Matthew, what you will find aside from Luke's account, it's a slight deviation, you will see that the very first thing that Jesus actually mentioned as he came out of the wilderness was the kingdom of God. Here's how Matthew records it, for example, in, four, in chapter 4, verse 17. Matthew says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the Mark's account says, Now after John was put in prison, Jesus kept to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. If you don't mind highlighting in your Bible, if you're taking notes, I'm going to take note of these particular terms here. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. That's the first thing we need to highlight to be aware of. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And secondly, saying the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the third thing. The kingdom of God is at hand. And here's the requisite for entering the kingdom of God. Repent and believe in the gospel. So there's four main points we need to highlight. The gospel of the kingdom of God, the time is fulfilled, is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen? Amen. And finally, we get to Luke, although he took a bit more of the scenic route. You know, he begins first with detailing Jesus, um, reading of Isaiah's prophecy in um, Luke chapter 4, verse 18, where Jesus quotes from the book of Isaiah 61, saying, The Lord is upon me. And then we see him also detailing Jesus, casting out demons. We see him also detailing Jesus, preaching with authority. We saw him also detailing Jesus, healing the sick, and the movement with compassion. We see that Luke's narrative of Jesus' initial stages of ministry where Jesus is performing signs and wonders. So what I love about Luke's account is even though it took a slight deviation in comparison to his fellow synoptic writers, is that before we see Jesus say, I must preach the kingdom of God, we see Jesus demonstrate the signs of the kingdom of God. Amen? Before we see Jesus say, I must preach the kingdom of God, in Luke's account, what we actually see is Jesus demonstrating the signs of the kingdom of God, healing the sick, casting out demons, t- 
teaching with authority, moving with compassion, suggesting to us, the audience, the recipients of the kingdom, that a kingdom merely in word with no signs, wonders or power is no kingdom at all. So if I can still take a slight deviation myself and follow Luke's approach, what I would say to us in my own words is this, that the proof of our kingdom citizenship in what we see Jesus prove just now, it's not merely found in what we say, it's found in what we do. Amen? If I look at you as a believer, and you say to me that you've renounced the kingdom of God and it abides within you, then the one thing I also ought to see are signs and wonders. And the one thing I also ought to see in our life demonstrate is the ability and the powers of the kingdom of God. It cannot come separate. It cannot come, I preached a few months ago, I think it was back in February, on the topic of water and wine. As I mentioned, our YouTube channel is packed to Revelation. Please go and check it out. I preached the message of water and wine, saying that God is raising a believer who is consumed both of the word of God and the power of God. Both of the word of God and the spirit of God. This is the nature of the kingdom. It's not divided. The nature of the kingdom is not one opposition, one side which has knowledge and understanding and another side which has power and authority. No, the kingdom of God comes in comprehension and assimilation of both. Amen? He found was something that was more valuable. So the encounter that you had with the king and the kingdom caused them to feel the need to do something. So he couldn't stay the same. Mm. He couldn't remain the same way that he was previously. He couldn't remain in the same vomit, in the same sick, in the same circumstances, in the same situations. He said that which I've encountered here is far greater than the previous experiences that I have. I need to do something. What can I do? He sold everything that he had. So kingdom citizens are those who come to the kingdom and are compelled to move in action. Amen? Wow. The, the citizens that are compelled to move swiftly. This is why Jesus, for example, even says, have a laid your, uh, have a laid your, your, your shovel and follow with the eyes of the kingdom. Don't look back. He is, he's, he's in and exhorting his believers to say, once you place your plow in the ground as a kingdom believer, you have to be swift and hasty. You have to be quick and moving. You have to be empowered with authority and such vigor that you want to make a difference in the lives of people. You have to progress forward. This is what it means to be a kingdom citizen. The parable I wanted to make use of was the parable of the woman with leaven. It says in Matthew 13 verse 33, I'm going to turn to it very quickly. This is our first point of scripture. Remember I said we're using our swords today. Amen? Amen. We are sword people. Matthew chapter 13 verse 33. If you dare say amen. 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 It's the parable of the leaven. And it says, another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of milk, till it was all leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of milk, till it was all leavened. Leaven essentially is a substance, essentially yeast, that causes bread to arise. So what we're seeing here is that yeast, even in its microscopic size, as small as it may be, what the believer is likened to being as leaven. What Jesus is saying is that as small as you may be, what would that be in your faith? What would that be in but in whatever capacity you may be, regardless of how you view yourself, when he places you in the right circumstances, even those that hold like that obscuring and overcoming you, you can cause that to be something that arises. You can cause bread to rise. So what Jesus is saying is that irrespective of how minuscule you may feel yourself to be, when you become a member of the kingdom, you are placed in a position where you can cause dead things to arise. Your prayers, your faith, your behavior, your intercession, your words, your manner, and all these things, if they are infused by the kingdom, to be like leaven is to be a difference. So Jesus is saying with this parable, I want you to be like leaven. I want you to find yourself in circumstances. See yeast in bread. But what you can see eventually is the fruit that comes out as a result of it. So sometimes you feel as if you can't see yourself. You can't see what's happening. You can't see your way out. You can't see what will come of this. But if you 
process of mm. what needs to be needed. What you eventually you will find is that bread is going to come to life. What you find is that your circumstance, your situation, and your life is going to turn around. And if you stay the course, if you will be a person of endurance, if you will be a person of strength, if you will be a person, person of, of pursuit and purpose, what you will find is that when you're needed in the things of God, that is deliberate, that is consistent, mm. that, that is perpetually present, you will find that something is going to change. John 3.16 mm. They may have quoted you in a scripture that had to do with love, but God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish by him eternal life. They probably can say that. Mm. As easy as that. Maybe if it's not love, they may say to you perhaps miracles. They may say that he was a great leader, but whatever it is that they may say to you, I doubt they will say the kingdom of heaven. Mm-hmm. That's sort of be my response. If you ask me the pieces of my faith up until two weeks ago, I would say, oh, you know, well, I would have quoted scripture at least. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, would, I would have just said, I would have quoted scripture as late. I would have at least said, oh, it's love of the Lord our God with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our souls. That's a good answer. That's right. You want to say I'm wrong? I want to say you're wrong. But Jesus emphasized from a different vantage point. From the vantage point of the kingdom. So why the kingdom? I was doing some exploration as a result of this week. And there are a few answers that I found which I thought to be so necessary for us as believers to be able to understand. Hence why I switched lanes from my sermon from focusing on level to focusing on this reality of the kingdom so we can understand truly the foundations in order for us to receive it properly because some missed it. And my prayer is that we don't miss the kingdom. I was observing from Luke's account initially, for example, where Luke says in chapter 1, verse 43, Jesus said, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. So, with the use of terms like must, purpose, and sent, Jesus himself answers our question, why the kingdom, and implies that the message of the kingdom wasn't a matter of convenience, it was a matter of obedience. Amen? Jesus preached the kingdom not because it was something that he just thought, oh, you know what, I've been in the wilderness for 40 days, what could my first sermon be? What will be the first thing that I say when I finally get this microphone? No. Jesus came out of the wilderness and went straight for the kingdom because it was the will of the Father. This is went straight to talking about the kingdom because it was the original desire of God from God from the Garden of Eden. Jesus went straight to talking about the kingdom because what he was coming back to restore was not a physical kingdom, but was to restore that which was ruled and raptured all the way back in the Eden. So when Jesus comes and preaches, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. What he's saying is that I want to restore back all that was lost and taken away by the cause of sin, that I may once again dwell and reign and rule with my sons and daughters who are going to come and believe in me. Jesus was saying that I've come for a purpose on this earth. The focal point, as I go further, is that Mark's narrative holds a number of key implications for how the early Jewish community, the local audience, would have perceived the message of the kingdom. To the local audience, the term kingdom, the literally meaning, would have been something they were familiar with. And by the time ta- the term the time is fulfilled, narrative implication would have caused a number of responses to arise within them. But of course speculation, but of course joy, but of course wonder, but of course some form of triumph, perhaps jubilation, and just general curiosity. This is came to fruition in the book of Luke, chapter 17, verse 20. Jeremy Saul's with you again, let's go to Luke, chapter 17, verse 20. We've seen this narrative of the kingdom and its implication beginning to take place. In Luke 17, chapter 20, we see the Pharisees, and it's when the time they'd experienced more than two thirds of Jesus' ministry, because we're now in chapter 17. And they've been hearing him preach and say various things pertaining to the kingdom of God, to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. The kingdom of heaven is like 
uh, man find a treasure. Their father also used to revealing himself to be the king over this kingdom. So then I get to a point where their frustration begins to grow old when they're saying, okay, look, Jesus, this is the Christian done interpretation, my interpretation. You keep preaching about this kingdom, where is it? You keep saying the kingdom of God is coming, the kingdom of God is at hand, where is the kingdom? So their frustration was coming to grow or not because what they were expect, expecting and anticipating was a physical kingdom. Hence why I said earlier that the kingdom that we have received now, there was a people that missed it. So they're asking Jesus, where is this kingdom? Because the literally meaning when they heard kingdom stuck up to them and the narrative implication, the times fulfilled, called them to arise now in their anticipation. So they're questioning Jesus, they're antagonizing. You keep saying kingdom, 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 kingdom. Where is the kingdom? Amen? Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he asked them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. No one they say, see here, see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Jesus was preaching a new type of kingdom and they missed it because they were so infatuated and so focused on the original old kingdom that they previously been accustomed to. We're going to explore this again a little bit further. So, what is this kingdom that the Jewish audience of the Israelites had been familiar with already? What, what, what is it about this magical kingdom that suggests that they had familiarity with it already? It dates all the way back to the Old Testament, where we know what was upon the side of Israel itself was a thriving kingdom through war and conquest in the promised land. They were able to conquer different nations and eventually able to establish themselves as a kingdom. Amen? Amen. We remember they had different kings like David, a man of war, and people like Joshua, warriors of battle, that were able to bring them victory and able to place them in a position where they were superpower in themselves. Of course, with the backing of Yahweh Sabaoth himself, the Lord of hosts. Mm. They were once upon a time a superpower. They were once upon a time reigning supremacy. They were once upon a time one in a position of influence. But at this point in time, when Jesus enters the scene and is preaching the matter of the kingdom, they were no longer in that position because of their own rebellion and their own disobedience. They were no longer in the moment in time a collective nation that were reigning supreme. In fact, they were under Roman subjugation. So what we find at this moment in time is that at the inception of Jesus' ministry, as he's preaching his kingdom, the kingdom they had previously had literally been rendered to nothing. So the people had been dispossessed of their land and lost their notoriety. They've been scattered across the nations and lost their success. They've been subdued and assimilated into many different kingdoms and lost their domain. Hence the question, when is the kingdom coming? And the hunger and the desire to be restored back to what in their eyes was normality. Amen? Amen. So, again, Jesus beginning his ministry of the topic of the kingdom, as I mentioned, was the will of the Father to take us back all the way to what was what was originally designed. Jesus preaching the kingdom was also a matter of showing God as a covenant keeping God. As a God who does not abandon his people. As a God who judges to restore. Because in Israel's disobedience and Israel's rebellion, from prophet to prophet to prophet, they received the various judgments of what was going to occur, what was going to happen. But in every single judgment, we see God always saying, I'm going to restore to redeem you. I'm going to call you back to my own. I'm going to give you double for what you have lost. And to the Jewish audience hearing this then, two responses would occur in themselves. For one audience, or perhaps a bit more humble and willing, God would be thinking, yo, okay, wait, there's a message happening about the kingdom. Maybe it's time. Maybe the kingdom has been restored. Is this is is the time for the fulfillment of prophecy? Or maybe the Reuben and the Pharisees say, who is this person that's making himself as God? But what would have occurred in their minds immediately is that they would have recorded prophecies prophesied in time past, such as the Kariah chapter 9. If you have your sword, let's turn to the Kariah chapter 9. So 
was like, rise up tonight and see a prophecy of how God is going to restore his people. We see a prophecy of how God is going to restore the kingdom to a people that are rebellious and abandoned his ways. Are we there? Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lonely riding on a donkey, a cock to the fall of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion, his dominion, his kingdom shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare to you that I will restore double to you. Amen. So this is what they potentially could have been thinking as they're hearing the king had been preached because it was something they were familiar with already. This is what they imagine they've been racing back to. This is what they would have been hoping for and anticipating. Because if a kingdom was coming and a king was coming, it meant that restoration was coming. It would mean joy was coming. It would mean that we would expect the consequence of the old regimes that had been ruling over them in their exile. But unfortunately, remember I said at the start of the message, we have received the kingdom, but there were people that missed the kingdom. Unfortunately, when they heard kingdom and time and at hand and good news and fulfilled, the one thing they neglected to hear was the requisite and required to be able to enter the kingdom, repent and believe. What they felt to neglect and the requisites that Jesus was laying out was to acknowledge their own disobedience and rebellion that caused the kingdom to be struck and to be scattered in the first place. Repent. They felt to acknowledge what Jesus was requiring of them in order to see the kingdom. Turn from your wicked ways. Turn from your sin. Turn from your idolatry. Turn from your vomit. You are consistently being saved by me and then consistently returning back to being the harlots that you are. You're consistently being saved by me and then turning back to perform your sin. Jesus was calling them to a place of repentance, but they missed it. They neglected to repent. So because they neglected to repent, they missed the kingdom. Because they failed to acknowledge the state of their own sin and wanted to pride themselves in just receiving a superpower, they missed the kingdom. And so, what is a received kingdom to us who have acknowledged our sinful ways and tough our wickedness was a missed kingdom today that refused to turn and instead they crucified the king of the kingdom. They had the opportunity to receive him and instead they crucified him, fulfilling nonetheless only with the promises necessary in order for the kingdom to come. They missed it. I want to quickly explore three crucial mistakes that they made that caused them to miss this kingdom so that we ourselves don't make the same mistakes, amen? amen. So that we ourselves don't make the same mistakes. My prayer earlier was that we would be filled with the wisdom and spiritual understanding of the kingdom. So there's lessons I want us to extract, the lessons that we can be able to apply in our own lives, especially over the duration of this series, as we're learning more and more about the kingdom to ensure that what we receive, what we learn, can be applied in our lives excellently and executed in the diligent way that God desires for it to be done so that we can actually be effective kingdom citizens and not they that neglect what is required. So there were three crucial mistakes that the initial audience made that caused them to miss the kingdom. The first one, actually I want to finish with my first one. I'll start with the second one. The second thing in which the people felt to understand that caused them to miss the kingdom was the manner in which the kingdom would come. The manner in which the kingdom would come. Amen? Amen. So, as I explored, prior to Israel's capture, they had their own kingdom, with their own monarchy, 
their own priesthood, their own law, their own religion, and their own customs. And remember, this kingdom had been established through war and conquest. And the war and conquest pertained to the promised land. We see this throughout the Chronicles, for example, the book of Exodus, of Numbers, of Deuteronomy, and Joshua. These chapters, these books, are all about Israel taking the promised land through war and conquest to establish their own kingdom in the land. And so you could forgive the Jews for assuming that the second kingdom was going to come about in the exact same way. They were expecting that this kingdom to come would be a re-establishment of the first. And so they were anticipating that it would come about in the same way. So they were expecting that God was going to come back like a military ruler like Joshua. They were expecting that it was going to come back with people with blood, smoke and thunder. So when Jesus comes on the scene and they say, forgive your enemies. And he comes on the scene and he's saying that you brood of vipers. And he comes on the scene and he's saying that you need to tell them repent from your wicked ways. They, they missed it. They weren't anticipating a, a, a king of a kingdom that was going to come with grace and truth. They were expecting that conquest and, and war and bloodshed was going to come forth. And how many times do we ourselves unfortunate sometimes? Miss the move of God in our lives because we're focusing on the things that he did yesterday. Because we're focusing on how God first revealed himself. Because we're still making an idol of how we first encountered God. Our first revelation of him. It reminds me of when um, the transfiguration. And Peter said, Lord, shall we just build a shrine right here and not go anywhere? And Jesus said to them, no. This is nothing that, this is just the beginning. But they were so fixated on what the experts had encountered in the first instance, in the first kingdom, that they missed the second because they refused to change their ways and acknowledge that actually my idolatry, my fixation on what I've seen previously could be the very thing that causes me to miss the new thing that God is doing. They missed the God who said to them, Behold, I do a new thing. They missed the God who said to them, that I'm always re innovating. They missed the God that said to them that I'm always restructurizing. They missed the God who said to them that I'm always making myself present in every generation in the ways that they need me. They missed the king full of grace and truth because they wanted to smoke and blood and they refused to repent. I pray that we will not miss the kingdom of God because we're fixated on what he did yesterday. I pray that we will not miss what we're going to do in our personal lives, in our church, in our careers, in our families, in our friendships, in whatever aspect of me be. I pray that the influence of the kingdom of God will not be neglected in our lives because we're too busy making an idol, making a shrine of what previously was, and refuse to return and see the new thing that he is doing. So that's the first one that we went that caused them to miss the kingdom. They didn't see the way, the manner in which it was coming. Amen? Amen. And then the third thing, <coughs> they misunderstood that I felt that caused them to miss the kingdom was they expected God to overthrow the Romans who were the leading kingdom just in the same fashion that God overthrew Egypt and Pharaoh. So they expected him to come back and establish Israel as a political superpower, but Jesus was coming to establish politics. Jesus was coming to come and save people by the law. He was coming to save people by grace and truth. Amen? Amen. So they expected that just as Jesus did with the first kingdom, they were going to experience in the second kingdom where there could be a nation that was established in their own economy, where there going to be a nation that was established in the physical means. Because you see, what they had was a physical kingdom. So a physical kingdom is established through physical natural means. So it was established through, again, to keep emphasizing the war, conquest, and even procreation. But the second kingdom that was going to now come was not going to be a physical kingdom established with hands. It was going to be a kingdom that was supernatural, that would be established through the work of the Spirit. Amen? It was going to be a kingdom that was going to be established through the supernatural grace of the Spirit of God. It was going to be a kingdom that was going, that was going to be established with means beyond this world. And as such, this kingdom would have no restrictions as it pertained to its size, its influence, its ability, its power, its authority, its dominion, or even its people. It was going to be a kingdom fortified in righteousness and in truth. 
was going to be a kingdom that was going to be established by justice. The first kingdom was a kingdom only for the Jews. So they expected that they were going to be the reigning supreme nation. But the second kingdom was going to be a kingdom that was going to come from above to call upon all nations, to call upon all tribes, upon all tongues, and upon among all peoples. It was going to be a kingdom supreme over all things. So they thought to understand the supremacy of what Jesus was trying to establish. The thoughts to accept the supremacy of what Jesus wanted to be enacted in the earth. We're still with our thoughts. If you turn with me to Daniel 2.44, Daniel 2.44, we'll see this kingdom that Jesus, the king of the kingdom, wanted to be established. The book of Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. It says, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, it will be governed by your own customs. And shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and shall stand forever. So we're going to break in pieces even the kingdom that they already had and thought they were going to receive back because that was insufficient in according to the original will and plan of God. So we're going to restore a kingdom that was preeminent of all kingdoms. So we're going to restore a kingdom that all kings from every sort of tribe, tongue, and nation will be able to acknowledge and say that, okay, wait, what we have, the customs, the economy, uh, and, and the, the markets that we have are incomparable to the kingdom that is at hand. God was trying to teach them about a kingdom that would come from above, that would be supreme, that have preeminence over every other kingdom. But they focused on what was small, they focused on what was minuscule. They focused on what people, on what appealed to them instead. How many times do we do that? We, 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 we miss the bigger picture. Just touch your neighbor from me very quickly and say that it's bigger than me. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than me. This type of God, the kingdom, they thought to, to, to set that when it was bigger than them. It was bigger than just restoring an economy. It was about righteousness being restored. We are singing that earlier. It was bigger than customs being established once again. It was about the laws of the kingdom being placed in the earth that you may have power and never find yourself in a position where you're once again subjugated. It was bigger than them. So they wanted war and conquest that made them feel puffed up in their own pride and their own status. But God was trying to give them something bigger that would cause them to never once again be in a position where they're about to question their identity. Where they'll never have to once again question whether they have a place. Where they'll never have to once again question where their home is. Where they'll never once again have to question if they could have a place to live. They missed the kingdom because of their poor focus. They will not miss the kingdom of God. May we not miss what God is doing in our lives because of a lack of focus. May we not miss what God is trying to do in our church, in our community, in our families because of our infatuation with what was previously done. Amen? Amen. May we see the preeminence of the kingdom. And the final point, and we're all tired, that caused them to miss the kingdom. We'll just label this very quickly and then I'll um, draw to a close. This was the first thing. I want to put it last because it's so, so important. The first thing that caused them to miss the kingdom was that they failed to understand and they failed to accept that Jesus was the king of the kingdom. They failed to accept that Jesus was the king of the kingdom. You see, in the prophecies mentioned, they anticipated they knew that God was going to reign over them as king. They were expecting they knew their theocracy at least would be established. But they never wanted to accept that the king of the kingdom was going to come in human flesh. Yeah. Was going to come and walk the earth. Was going to come and sit with sinners. Was going to come and literally do the things that are mundane, the day to day activities of man. What kind of king is that? So they refused to accept that this was going to be the king over them. 
And we see in Jesus' early ministry, when he begins, and even in Mark chapter 1, verse 40, Jesus heals a man of leprosy. One of the first immediate things that Jesus would say when he began his ministry is that he would say to someone after he's healed them or, or performed a miracle for them, he would say to them, see that you say nothing to anyone. And the reason being was because the time of Jesus' revelation had not yet come. The time for Jesus to be seen as the king of the kingdom had not yet come. But we see progressively as the Bible goes and orchestrates and narrates the story of Jesus, we see progressively begin to reveal himself as the king of the kingdom. In John chapter 14, for example, he says that you believe in God, believe also in me, mm-hmm. make yourself equal with God. And that would cause the, uh, the Pharisees to be kind of ruffled in the wrong way because now Jesus is equating himself to God. So they wanted, and they, so they knew that God was going to be king over them, but the king is in of sinners. The king is not smoking anyone. The king is healing on the Sabbath. The king is contradicting himself, they were saying. So they're anticipating a king to come, but they're not accepting that this is the king who is right before them. And so, what we then see in the progressive narrative of Jesus continuing to reveal himself as king over the kingdom is the bigger to downplay the minimize is his influence by saying things, for example, such as, Where did this man get his wisdom and his mind to work from? Is that like the carpenter's son? Is his mother called Mary, and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon and Judas, and his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? They were familiar with the king, so they missed the kingdom. They got familiar with the power of God, minimized it, so they missed the brilliance that would come. How many times do we become familiar with God? Treat him regular. Lose our reverence. Lose our adoration. Lose our, our posture. And just treat him as any other. Fail to pledge to hallow him as king. Fail to actually appreciate him as divine ruler over all the earth. To see him as the preeminent one the head of the church, the face of the invisible God, the immortal one, creator of all things. Elohim, I don't know how many times do we just minimize him to an acquaintance, to a friend, to a buddy, to the carpenter's son. They missed the kingdom because they became familiar with the king. So despite Jesus' science and performing miracles, and all these various things, we see subsequently the accused of blasphemy and insurrection, and they lead to him being crucified. They lead to him being placed on a cross because of their own actions and their sinfulness. Praise be to God, that was for our benefit. Amen. Mm-hmm. Praise be to God, that was so that we could receive the kingdom in ourselves. But this exploration of how they missed the kingdom, I believe, can be applied in our day-to-day context as we can to navigate this series of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever it may be like in your life, my prayer, or our desire, my desire for all of us, our meditation would be that we're not going to be thinking that this thing is minuscule and is bigger than us. We'll see the picture that we'll be seen. That we'll see ourselves in a position where we'll become familiar with the king, but we'll truly worship him in the peace of his holiness. how Israel missed the kingdom of heaven. They expected a king like David, so they missed Christ's coronation. A donkey on a fall, a, a, a man on a donkey, a king on a donkey. They expected a conqueror like Joshua, so they missed Christ's coming, full of grace and truth. They expected a kingdom like the first, so they missed Christ's conquest. Kingdom of God is within you. And when I consider what I've shared so far as I draw to a close, I can't help but consider how are we receiving the kingdom of God? How are we posturing ourselves to receive the kingdom of God? The Pharisees, they waited for it, 
the question for it, the love for it, and they still missed it because of the condition of their hearts. Jesus said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. No one they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. We can't talk about the kingdom of heaven being like anything without first talking about the nature and the state of the heart. Because the kingdom of God dwells within the heart. So if we're going to be recipients and, and actors and those that benefit as recipients of the kingdom, we truly have to depend on and consider what is the state of our hearts? What is the condition of my heart? God wants to dwell the fullness of his kingdom within you and to have you enact it on the earth in power with signs and wonders. But it begins with the heart. It begins with a heart transformed. It begins with a heart that's tired. It begins with a heart that's re repentant. It begins because of a heart that's, that's yielded. And repentance doesn't only have to be referred to as a type of away from sin, but it means uh, don't, don't touch anything that defiles. Be consistently transformed and yielded and going higher and higher in the things of God. No looking at an idol of previous seasons, but thanking God for the lessons found therein and being able to prepare and move forward. Maybe perhaps what God has come said a little bit to say to us in our conclusion is, what is the state of your heart so you don't miss the kingdom? The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Will you receive it? It has come with righteousness, with grace and truth, with mercy and salvation and joy and strength for the weak and healing for the sick and deliverance for the bound and comfort for those who mourn. It has come with righteousness that you may be planted. It has come with, with, with everything that is necessary for you to live a life of godliness in abundance. But will you receive it in your repentance? And I believe the foundations of this, as Tapson prayed earlier, is that we may increase in spiritual wisdom and understanding. In spiritual wisdom and understanding. I want you to let maybe perhaps place your the hand on your heart. And just say, Lord, I don't want to miss your kingdom. Lord, I don't want to miss what you're doing today. And just pray for yourself that, Lord, I don't want to miss your kingdom. Let my heart be right before you. What you need to take away, what needs to be changed, what needs to be transformed, what needs to be discarded. Lord, I don't want to miss your kingdom. Father, I repent for familiarity. Father, I repent for minimizing it. Father, I repent for exalting myself. Father, I repent for my pride. Father, I repent for seeing myself as the bigger picture and not seeing the grandness of your kingdom. And I ask in the name of Jesus, would you cause me, oh God, to see the preeminence of your kingdom? to understand that it's more grand and more bigger than what I could ever think or imagine. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus the Christ that this moment in time you meet to this point of our need to turn our hearts to you. For you said unto Israel, turn and turn and turn from that which devours, that you may receive the kingdom of God. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that we will turn and turn and turn from that which devours us, O God. We will turn from that which distracts us, O God. We will turn from that which Father God wants to cause it to be a more within our souls, a more within our our hearts, that we may be pure and blameless before you, Lord, to be recipients of this kingdom, to be participators in this kingdom, to be an actors of this kingdom, to be rulers within this kingdom, to reign with you in this kingdom. Oh, Lord, if the gift of our hearts, we will not be as the Israelites and the Pharisees. We will not miss your kingdom because of our fixation on the old and the fixation of ourselves. But we humble ourselves. And we say, Jesus, we receive your kingdom. The kingdom is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Amen. Amen.
preserved. It's a kingdom that cannot be removed. Amen. Amen. It's from everlasting to everlasting. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God for his kingdom to which we belong. Amen. Glory be to God, church. Let's take our seats off the comprehensive message. Thank you so much, Christian. Let's thank God for this young man. Praise be to God. Amen. Amen. Praise be to the Lord. And we. We are so glad to receive of His Word. Amen. Amen. To be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be corrected. Amen. Amen. Let God be glorified in the entrance of His Word. Let it bring forth revelation and light. Amen. Amen. As we go forth from this place, let not this Word depart from our hearts. Amen. Amen. And from our minds. Let's hold on to the Word. We are kingdom people. As Corinne said last week, we the people of God. Amen. That's who we are. We are the people of God. Amen. We are the people of God. We are the people of the kingdom of heaven. Praise be unto the Lord. I've just got a few announcements, if that's okay, church. There's, a, there's quite a few. First of all, Tuesday evening is our prayer meeting. We meet in the foyer there at 6.30 p.m. And we just pray for the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. We pray for the kingdom of heaven relates to the life of this church and we pray as it relates to individuals and as it relates wider the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. And so do join us on Tuesday and come let us worship and pray together. 6.30 p.m. And then this Friday is also a Bible study. Praise the Lord. Bible study. We're studying 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and we'll be meeting here in the foyer again on Friday at 6.30 p.m. Do join us for our fortnightly Bible study session. Amen. Amen. It's been so powerful as we've been going through uh, that first letter of Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth. So do join us for uh, chapter 8. And then on Saturday, Saturday coming, this Saturday coming, we've got altar worship we will be here. Altar worship. Praise the Lord. Are you coming to altar worship? Yeah, no, no. non-committal. I think that's a wise place to be. Uh, but do join us on uh, on Saturday at 7 p.m. Uh, it starts, so do come in at maybe about for 6.30 if we're to start at, at, at 7 p.m. And just be in that place of prayer, just be in that place of worship, amen? Isaac and his wife Esther will be leading, and such a wonderful, wonderful couple uh, that love God. You know, and they're really pressing in to the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that the kingdom of God suffereth violence. Amen. But the violent shall take the violent take it by force. And so we, the children of God, have also got to be equally present. Amen. Amen. We've got to be equally present and to to face the darkness with the light of God and the power of God. That Christian was preaching is about the power. Amen. Amen. The signs and the wonders. Accompanied by the word. Amen. Amen. So, uh, altar worship on Saturday, 6.30 for a 7 p.m. start. Please do join us at Temple Church. Make an effort. Amen. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, make an effort. Make an Find effort. someone and say, make an effort. Make an effort. Make an effort. Make an effort. Amen. Praise the Lord. And then we've got a couple of weddings, Temple Church. <laughs> So we've got Regine and Khalil. That's Khalil there. Khalil Sam. Regine's not here today, but Khalil's representing. Amen. <laughs> so Regine and Khalil's wedding will be on the 15th of August at Tuesday evening. And uh, we'll be heading across there and blessing them in the name of Jesus. And so it is our great pleasure to see these ones jo being joined together in matrimony to advance the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. Do you know marriages and weddings? Marriages are, 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 are at the heart of what God wants to do with His kingdom. Amen. And how God wants to advance His kingdom. Which is why marriages are also being sabotaged by the enemy. Right? Do you see this? Yeah. Which is why we have to celebrate every Christian wedding. Every Christian marriage has got to be celebrated, amen? amen. Because it's about the advancement of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. amen. Praise be unto the Lord. And then the second uh, wedding is Jacob and Olam and Jacob. Yeah. Jacob and Olam and Jacob. You have seen Jacob and 
come here every Sunday because he's in, he's in London, he's down south, I think he's actually in Kent. Mm. And uh, every now and again he will come and you've seen him drumming for us. <laughs> he was part of this church here for many years when he was starting to be a doctor. And now he's found another doctor. Uh, <laughs> and uh, fantastic Christian uh, young lady, Christian parents who run a church as well in London. And so we praise God for them. And so we're celebrating them on the 24th of August. We'll be going, heading off uh, to celebrate with them. I think it's down south near Bedford somewhere, isn't it? So praise be unto God. Keep, it, keep them in prayer. We want more marriages like this. Amen. Amen. That are founded upon the rock. That is Christ. Kingdom marriages. Amen. Amen. So those are the two marriages. Let's just, let's just, in fact, let's do it now. Let's just pray over them. Just bless them in the name of Jesus. Just pray for God's protection upon these, 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 these couples and just pray that uh, every plan uh, uh, just be executed with excellence and that the enemy will not come to steal, kill and to destroy, Father. But we come in the name of Jesus to arrest every work and, and every plan of the enemy in the name of Jesus. And these days will be blessed days, there'll be happy days, and the Father, there'll, there'll be days filled with your presence, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. We just command a blessing upon them, and we pray, Lord, for, for just a wonderful day in your presence for these couples, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And then 6th of August is Nation Sunday. Yeah. I love Nation Sunday. Uh, Nation Sunday is about celebrating unity and diversity. You see our church, look around. Just, just richness of diversity. People from different ethnicities, people from different races, different countries and cultures, different ages. Amen. Amen. We praise God for that unity in diversity. This is at the heart of what Temple Church is about. Amen. Amen. This is a non-racist church. Amen. Amen. Non-xenophobic church. Amen. This is just the church of God in Jesus Christ where everyone is welcome. Amen. Amen. So we want to celebrate that on the 6th of August, which is also the anniversary of the church. We'll be celebrating nine years of Temple Church. But the Lord is still on the throne. Amen. Amen. The Lord is still on the throne. So 6th of August. So these two things that you need to take note of on the 6th of August. Uh, we like to celebrate in food. We eat it. We love to eat. I hear what I'm saying. We love to what? Eat. Eat. We love to eat. We, we've got, a, there's a proverb in, in African uh, kind of saying, or African saying, if you like, in African culture. We says that food food um, completes us. <laughs> For food completes us. In other words, it builds relationships. Yeah, yeah? it builds relationships. <laughs> Arise, kill and eat, he says. <laughs> it builds relationships. And so, I am a firm believer of that. You know, we, we eat together. And we break bread together. That is a sign of community. Even Jesus broke bread with his disciples. We call it communion, but it is actually about community. Amen. Amen. It's actually about community. So, if you've got food that you can bring from wherever you're, you're from and, and, or the country that you're associated with, Amen? Because all of us are British now. Yeah? <laughs> but I was born in Zimbabwe, so I love my Zimbabwean food. Amen? <laughs> so I'll bring along some Zimbabwean food. Amen? And there'll be people from different nationalities. There'll, there'll be Nigerians who bring some Agusu. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? A goosey. A goosey. Some Nigerians will bring some goosey and some Ghanaians will bring what? Shito. 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 Any Shito people in here? Not today. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a Nigerian shaking on. That's not your food. That's not your food, Naya. <laughs> yeah? And then we've got some Filipino guys in here. Hey. Anything that's poor. <laughs> Roasted, fried, broiled, whatever it is, and bring pork. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we praise God. So different national. We've got some English people. Fairly boring, but we love them anyway. We love them anyway. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> 
<laughs> just as you are, says the Lord. Just come as you are. Even if you're English, come as you are. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. So we celebrate that unity and diversity in the food that we eat. So we'll have some food on the Sunday. And then we'll also have acts of worship. So if you've got song on your heart you would like to sing in your uh, mother tongue or in the uh, culture that you associate with, please feel free. Equally, if you've got a, a poem or a spoken word, whatever it is, just bring it and celebrate and worship God with what you have. Amen. Amen. It's about unity in diversity. So what we're going to do on the Saturday, the 5th of August, in the evening, we'll be doing preparation for Nation Sunday here. So we do the food down, down in the basement, uh, in the lower hall. Uh, and so we, we need some helpers, people to get all of that together. And I, I can see Steve nodding because I'm booking him straight away. <laughs> right now, because Steve does the flags and he put the flags up. And being a fireman and stuff, he knows how to do things safely, unlike me. Unlike me. You don't want to see me up there. <laughs> when I come down, uh, you won't be able to pick me up. But Steve won't come down. Amen. Amen. You'll go up and come down on the ladder. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So anyone else who wants to help on Saturday, the 5th of August, will meet here about 6 p.m., 6.30 p.m. at the latest. And it'll just be about a couple of hours and we're done. Yeah? And we're ready and pressed for Sunday. Amen. And then, uh, final announcement is discipleship groups. We seek to relaunch the discipleship groups in the autumn, yeah? Discipleship groups are our, uh, uh, our uh, kind of Bible study, stroke, life, uh, stroke, uh, everything uh, group. You know, we just do life together in those groups, but we're centered around the Word of God. Those are discipleship groups that will happen in different homes. So if you want to volunteer your home as a, as a, as a, as a discipleship, uh, discipleship group, location, then please let me know and I will take you through training on what it means to be a discipleship group leader. And uh, there's, a, there's a few, a uh, couple of us in here who've run discipleship groups for a while and we know what it's about. Steve and Jane have run one as well. Praise God. See, see Steve and Jane, that's them. That's them there. They know what it's about. And I've run one, of course, with, with, with our jacket here. Uh, but the rest of you uh, have an opportunity to be part of this movement of discipleship. Amen? Amen. That's what our church is about. It's about discipleship. So if you feel like you can uh, become a discipleship group leader, talk to me. Amen? And then, sorry, I've got one more thing. Blogging. So I've received already an entry from uh, 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 Yuri. Praise the Lord. It's going to be missing It's going on next week. She's hidden talent. This is, this is Yuri. She hides a light under the bush. Fantastic, fantastic writing, and I'll be posting that on our website uh, this week. But if you've got a blog or anything that you'd like to, to share with people, any writing that you'd like to put on uh, on the church website, please let me know. Amen. Amen. Don't hide your light under the bushel. Let us all take a part, uh, take part in advancing the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Amen. So that's all our announcements today. Praise the Lord. We've come to the end of our service. But we haven't come to the end of our pursuit. We continue to pursue God with absolutely everything. With absolutely everything. everything that we have in us must praise ye the Lord. Amen. Amen. So we continue to praise God with absolutely everything. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and grant you all peace. In Jesus' name, you are blessed. Amen, and amen, and amen. See you again next week, church. Okay.